Ma uh, Maya. And Maya is also a form of the goddess Seshet, which is the one that we're basically going to focus on. The goddess Seshet is one that is called uh, it's S E S H E T. And her name means she who is foremost in the house of books. She who is foremost in the house of books. It is said that the god of wisdom, Tahuti, or Thoth, that's where you get the word thought from. Thoth is the Greek word, Tahuti, or Tot, is the Egyptian word, and Hermes is later on the Greek word. <coughs> um, Thoth, or Tahuti, is the god of wisdom, knowledge, chemistry, alchemy, music, science. Um, just about any type of science, physical science, metaphysical science, any type of science is the God to Hootie. But it is said, and it's interesting here that I would, I would say this on my first tape, the Dogon tape. And this year we got a, a response from Seshet. And it is said that Seshet, which is supposed to be his consort, but also they tell you that Maya is his consort. So, in so many words, the Satsashet is his consort, and Maya is, uh, is his consort. These gods and goddesses are not to be looked upon as a person of, of, of many wives. What it means is, what it really means is, you're supposed to draw a parallel that Maya and Seshet are different attributes of the same goddess, <coughs> of, the, of the same goddess. And so ultimately, Maya is Seshet's return. Now, I did a lecture on Seshet. We're going to open this up. It's interesting. Uh, I mentioned her in, two, in 92 when I first did my Dogon lecture, which was my first lecture. And in the, and in the years past, I rarely found major material on Seshet. She's, you can hardly find anything on her. And when you do... She's one amongst the pantheon of the Egyptian gods. <coughs> one, of the, one of the best explanations of her would come from the Dictionary of Ancient Deities that I talk about, Dictionary of Ancient Deities by Charles Russell Coulter and Patricia Turner, um, which, is, which has some um, um, information on her. And it's probably in the other Egyptian books they talk about her, but it's ironic that all those years I didn't get a, a full peace on her, and then all of a sudden, this fall of the year, in September, we was at a melanin conference, and at the end of the melanin conference, we had a symposium of a bunch of scholars, me, Richard King, it was a, a, a cadre of scholars that was on there and was talking about melanin. So in the middle of the a symposium, when people would come and ask the questions, they would ask us questions. Some sister stood up and asked a question about Seshet. And I told her, I said, well, I think I'm going to take this, you know, because they asked whatever the one they wanted to answer. And I said, well, I think I'll take this. And I went into my explanation of Seshet. But I told her, I said, more than likely, because this is the first time I heard her name um, uttered from somebody that's in the audience and it was not a part of a scholastic aspect of, of scholarship. That means that this goddess has to be in the building. She's here now. And then the sister Rosalind Jeffries, which is the wife of Leonard Jeffries, picked up on it and said, yes, uh, because you made the observation that she might be here, and probably more than likely she is here. So when I got back home, I got in touch with Seshet, and I said, well, um, were you there? And she said, yes. And it was about time that I was recognized. In so many words, and what that means is, so I said, okay, and, this, and I said, what does this, what does this mean? First of all, the God Tahuti gets the credit for the God of wisdom. But they say that she sits beside Tahuti and whispers the wisdom in his ear. So obviously this is a, 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 a goddess that needs to be focused on. Now, it was interesting that she would come to the Melanin Conference because they say that Melanin is almost like a cosmic computer. It is the Akashic records. The word Akash means black substance. So it is fitting that she would come if she is the she who is the 
in the foremost, is she who is foremost in the house of books, and that means that she is the divine secretary or the divine librarian. And melanin being the Akashic records in our minds, then obviously this God is sets over that. And it's and everything is everything. Now my mother just passed on, on June the twentieth, and she was a she used to read so many books back in the seventies until they had she would go to these department stores and they would get these stores and they would give her and they had a thing if you tear the cover off the book you could trade the book in. Right. And she had so many books that she used to read on these paperback books until the guy was like, well, we don't have no more, more books to give you because you got all of them, you read them all. So she would still donate the books to the store. But I was saying, you know, it's amazing if this type of knowledge would have come around in the 70s, then she would be one of the grand librarians, although she was very, had a whole lot of knowledge and probably one of the reasons why I was able to think the way I think now, but the key here is, I think, by Sashet coming, I think in so many words, she was of that same aura and that same energy. And so I think when Sashet came this time, I think there was a connection between Sashet and my mother in that same aura. And I think each, each one of us sits, in, uh, sits under an umbrella or an aura. It's about like the universe, they say your head. You know, what is your head, you know, so it'll be a multiplicity of people that will be under the umbrella or a, a, a certain energy field of a certain god and goddess. And I think by mother passing and by her being this avid reader like that, then I think this has something to do at this particular time in so much to say that this is obviously her time. And that's what we're getting at as far as says she. So um, I implore people to go and try to find as much information as we can get on her on the internet and try to um, um, uh, compile it and make a compilation of it. You see what I'm saying? But then again, on the other hand, this is a form of a Maya type of, 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 of energy. So I also tell people to get the book Maya Magic by Nima that was put out in 1995 and just came back in print. Um, I think last year, Maya Magic by Nima. Which is interesting because um, the, the god Horus came back in 1904 and, 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 and dictated this book of law that Crawley um, used and from the day he died he never claimed that he was the author of it, that it was Horus through the angel Awas <coughs> in 1904. Well in 1973 in 1973 um Mayat came and dictated uh, some, some, some sacred writings or spiritual um, teachings to this woman, Nima, in 1973. And so she put it in this book, Mayat Magic. So that's another book we need to get and study the actual stuff that, that when this, 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 this channel that came or this transmission of Mayat. And now we have this aspect of Seshet. So, Give you how things work. We're in Brother Ray's house now, and he's a brother that is a, a, a avid um, body on the computer, on on the internet, searching the web and chronicling chronicling all this type of um, information. So it's interesting how things would come about as far as Seshet coming. And, and, and coming in the aspect of, of energies at this particular time in the house that we are in at this particular time. You see what I'm saying? So it's not by mistake that, uh, and I knew, I said, well, the next lecture that I do is going to have to be on Seth yet. And I didn't do a lot on it last night, but it's interesting that we would come tonight, and when you put this statue up, I said, okay, then. <laughs> this is this this is how this stuff all comes, and I'm quite sure she's gonna be very pleased about that. Um, um, and I and I'm quite sure that if you uh, get the dictionary of ancient deities, we need to find out what other goddesses that line up with this particular goddess, this divine librarian or divine uh, secretary. You see what I'm saying? And so uh, it's it's very interesting here. Now, 
Uh, with that, we're going to, um, the sister, uh, Enrica, Enrica, that came from Houston, that was, well, came from New Orleans, then had to hightail it to Houston, uh, I'm quite, you know, to Houston, and I'm quite sure she's still in exile from where she's from. Um, she brought this, uh, 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 Haitian rum, and so this is, it's, 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 it's fitting that we'll spit some of this to the gods and goddesses, and also, like I said again, we are also celebrating the return of um, my queen that's here in the house, because this is her area, um, so this is like a homecoming for her, and all, because she hadn't been back to D.C. and Baltimore and this area since she went down south and lost her mind and became a country girl and loved it. <laughs> and we can't get her to come back now, you know. And her thing is, is you know, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily, uh, in her thing, it's the weather. You see what I'm saying? This, I've never seen a person that was raised up north that absolutely hates any type of cold. You know what I'm saying? You know. I mean, she would put on an overcoat just to go out to the mailbox, and I'm like, it's only going to take five seconds. Whereas I'll go out there in some flip flaps and, and, and my underwear. You see, she'll put on an overcoat and a hat just to go out there, and I'm like, man, I don't know how you survived 40 plus years in a cold environment, and then she went even up to Philly after she left D.C. and was even colder. But she got down in Atlanta and lost her mind. So I know this has got, got to be about the weather. And also, we're going to spit this particular uh, room to, um, uh, uh, you know, and then we'll, to set shit. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do, we're going to call on one goddess at this particular time, and that's going to be set shit. But then again, and we'll, well, i got to put a little Zuni in there because she, that's your, uh, that's who you in contact with, and you did supply the room. So we're going to do set shit. Erzuli, uh, Tara at this particular time, Kwan Yin, naturally locks me for money, <laughs> and um, Mayat at this time. So we'll just uh, spit the libations to those one. I already called them out, so we'll just do this four ways. Not on the wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. I'll take a little libation myself. <laughs> yeah. We also want to give a shout out to Seth Mendurga and Kali and Lalita because they are also instrumental in <clears throat> this uh, rising of this Kundalini energy and the goddess Kundalini because we're still um, um, dealing with this global warming thing that we're dealing with at this particular time. Um, I want to read another prophecy that can be found in a pro there's, like, there's several prophecies. We read one in what was that Bible verse? Because uh, we're reclaiming all of our stuff. Because anything that's been written in ancient books is only written by one, written for one people, and the indigenous lineage of those one people. But that was um, Deuteronomy something. Um, and we want to get that, put that back on the actual tape. Um, and the sister, the Shakta. Elder um, uh, read it out last night, um, um, which was great to put her energy on it. You know, I retrieved this information. I think it was Deuteronomy 28, chapter 28, verse 49. No, no, uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 um, is where it started. On down to 49, on down to verse 49. I think that's how it goes. But anyway, it's a whole chapter on us and, and, and our manifestation into slavery and what we've been going through in the modern era of the suffering. So uh, the other one that we want to talk about is one that comes from the Gnostic text. It was dug up in 1945, which was also one that talked about um us losing our mind and our memory. Remember last night I talked about um, how to, uh, in the book, the spirit books, they talk about how these entities, they tell them to go down to earth. <clears throat> and they say, oh yeah, no problem. You know, I'm a god. I go down there to little humans and I rule. Right, right. But they put this baby brain on them when they get down here and they become deaf, dumb, and blind because they got a baby brain on them. Mm. So over the years, the baby brain develops and the god forgets that it used to be a god. You see what I'm saying? We have glimpses of it, 
But basically, that's what happens very hard on this on this level. And that's in the book called the Spirit's Book. Um, well, this is one that also is the same way. This is a, a, a text that you can get in a book called Oracle of the Illuminati by um, William Henry. He, put, he first put out a Cloak of the Illuminati, Oracle of the Illuminati is the second one, and the new one is called Mary Magdalene Illuminator. But this Oracle of the Illuminati came out, I think, last year. And he's taking one of the texts that you could also find in um, the Gnostic text by Bentley Layton, as well as um, uh, the Nag Hammadi Library and any of these Gnostic teachings. And this is called the uh, the Hymn of the Pearl is the name of the actual text. Um, the Hymn of the Pearl. You can find that in, um, like I said, the Gnostic scripture by Bentley Layton or the Nag Hammadi Library, which is all these texts that was dug up in 1945. Now, um, Thomas, in this case, is a form of Horus or Heru. And Thomas is from a royal line or line of kings. And in this particular case, these kings are the gods. So he's got to go down into Kemet or Egypt to recover a pearl that resides near a ravenous dragon. So it's this same journey that you get in the Lord of the Rings and all the chivalry, and they got to go battle the dragon, the dragon slay, and all these particular movies and these epic tales. Well, all these come out of, uh, out of, out of Africa <clears throat> and around the world, in classical mythology around the world. The mystery here is that he goes down into Egypt, the land of bondage. Now, this is an Egyptian story. So you say to me, how can the, why would the Egyptians call their land the land of bondage? And this text has its origin in Egypt. Well, number one, to show you that they didn't have to too much, do too much changing from the book of Exodus, because the land of bondage that they was talking about was just talking about the physical earth or the physical realm. Since they were Egyptians, they just called the physical earth Egypt. You see, so this is how this comes about. How would the Egyptians, the Egypt, they were not talking about the Egyptian civilization being an unfair civilization compared to other civilizations. They was talking about, we live in Egypt, and at that particular time, so in our viewpoint, this is a physical world, and it's the land of bondage. You get where I'm coming from here? So they say, go down into the land of bondage and recover the pearl that resides there. And so Thomas, like the spirit book, say, no problem. I'll take no problem. I'll go down into the land of bondage, and I'll recover this pearl. And he gets into the land of bondage and forgets that he's this kingly, priestly person of a royal, noble birth. You see, king of kings, lord of lords, because this is the same Jesus story. And he forgets it, and he's just chilling in Kemet amongst the people, thinking he's normal, and, you know, uh, and normal, and a couple of years go by, and he don't even know who he is. And so as a result, his family understands that he has lost his mind and has some type of amnesia. And so they have to send him a series of letters and envoys and people that can come and give him a series of letters. And each one of these letters are books, are knowledge. You see what I'm saying? Tells him and reminds him of who he is. Thus, he, when he realized who he is and what has happened to him, he was hit in the head. He recovers the pearl, and the pearl just so happens to be his own soul. Well, the same concept here. Now, this is this is a story, but this actual story is talking about us in the future. You see, and how we went down, we had a job to do. We got hit in the head. You see what I'm saying? We're thinking we American, thinking we European, a 
uh, thinking we are the people of this world today and understood that we were a God type people trying to receive our soul, which would bring us back to the God realm, but we got hit in the head. So here's another one of those prophecies mm -hmm. called uh, the, 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 the hymn of the pearl. But you can get the, you can get the, uh, technical version of it in the Bentley Layton's Gnostic Scriptures of the Nag Hammadi Library, but if you want to get the uh, 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 short synopsis, just get the new book uh, by um, uh, William Henry, Oracle of the Illuminati. So it's just, just going back over and over. Now, the character of these texts is the same text that would later on be in the Old Testament that Israel, we talk about modern Israel, is using, you see what I'm saying, to masquerade as the chosen people because they have suffered under the hands of something, which we only have the modern European as far as this grand suffering that they talk about in a contrived suffering of 1940, from 1940 to 1945, or maybe 1939, so we talk about about a six-year period of something that was set up so that they could fulfill a certain amount of prophecies that wasn't theirs. So we now know that the entire German-Jewish connection, you see what I'm saying, was a connection between the heads of Israel, or the, excuse me, the heads of the Jewish community and the German Nazi National Socialist Party to uh, take a group of people and sacrifice them so that they can fulfill prophecy and then later on take land that's not theirs in 1948 because these are Europeans and no way that you get European to have anything to do with the historical origin of the Hebrews. Meanwhile, the Hebrews took a story that the Egyptians had and they'll be nothing but an extension of, of an Egyptian society. They took the story, you see what I'm saying, and edited it to their realm but what we're talking about here is still the story in the Old Testament of a future people that is the black people in the diaspora. You see what I'm saying? And ultimately the whole world. You see, the land of Egypt at this particular time is the land of bondage has to be America. And Washington, D.C. teaches us that it is the new Egypt. You see, the new lot of Cam, which was supposed to be America, that the Moors, when they introduced a lot of these things up through, through, through um, Scotland and through uh, Ireland, or uh, these Arthurian mythologies of Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table, Knights ultimately being black, that it was supposed to be America they was talking about in a future land that hadn't been established yet that you will see quoted in the first Highlander movie. There's a future land that hadn't been established yet, and we are our mortals, and we should walk the earth until the great quickening of, the, uh, of that future land that hadn't been established yet, and there'll be a great quickening. You see what I'm saying? And so uh, a great gathering. So the Moors brought this particular information to Europe, and Britain that got a hold of some of these texts Name themselves Camelot, but the Camelot was supposed to be America. You see what I'm saying? It's supposed to be America. So this is the new lot of Cam, you see, which is supposed to be America as well as D.C. It's all laid out like Kemet. No doubt. You see, and you got the new book by uh, Tony Broder, Washington on the book. On the Egypt platonic. Platonic. Egypt on the platonic. On the platonic. In the secrets of plain sight. Huh? Yeah, you're right, that book. So my point here is um, the people that's in bondage, you know, obviously they were talking about us. And so now we have the original text where he's coming from is the Hermetic text, uh, which like I, said, uh, like I said, Walter Scott's book, Hermetica, um, has the, some of the prophecies. Another book now called Hermetica um, by Peter Gandy and Timothy Freak, um, Hermetica book called Copenhagen has a part of the prophecy in Hermetica. So there's three Hermeticas out. Then you got the back of the Nag Hammadi Library. Not only do you have this Gospel of Thomas, or this, 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 this story of Thomas and the Pearl, or the Hymn of the Pearl, you also have the same prophecy from the Hermetic text of Asclepius talking about 
um, being explained that we will be in bondage and all of our minds, all of our bodies will be Egyptian, our mind will be of another race. So that's also in the Nag Hammadi library of the same prophecies and, and stuff. So, um, so these these prophecies and stuff originate out of the Hermetic prophecies, um, and then taken from the Hermetic prophecies, the Hebrews translate their version of the myth. And in the later day, Egyptians called the Gnostics translate their version of the of myth. So we got at least three versions of the same myth having its origin in ancient Egypt. You see what I'm saying? So this is very key, um, um, which is talking about us. And even in the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha, which is books that wasn't added into the Gospels, you know, they got a whole... Um, they had a, got a whole special on the um, History Channel, banned books of the Bible. But what the Apocrypha that wasn't added into the Gospel, there's a part in there in the book of Ezra, where they talk about this ego ruling the world, and then uprises a young lion that will trample and topple the ego. The ego obviously has to be a miracle. And the lion has to actually be the new Egyptians, the Sphinx, or the Africans, which is the, our monarch, is a lion. Right, right. If anything that encapsulates not only Egypt, but all of Africa, is that one aspect, which is the lion. Which has a lot to do with why we're here today seeing this thing actually happening with the global warming. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Because the lion is connected with the global warming. Because segment is connected with the global warming, and the global warming is the kundalini energy. You see, kundalini, kundalini segment, the lion. Uh, segment being the kundalini goddess, a durga, a durga being the um, kundalini goddess, or a form of segment because segment is on a lion. Durga first appears riding a lion. So Durga is the East Indian version of this Sphinx goddess that when we translate it down, it's talking about the Kundalini energy, which is global warming. Now, this is very interesting because to piggyback off of this thing, we talked about this a little last night, that we now know that the global warming is the Kundalini on the inside of the people, the indigenous people of the serpentine people. In Peter Tompkins' book, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. <coughs> Get a little equalizer here. Yeah. Secrets, no, excuse me, not Secrets of the Great Pyramid. He had Secrets of the Great Pyramid, which is an excellent book. But either Mysteries or Secrets of the Mexican Pyramid. I think it's called Mysteries or Secrets of the Mexican Pyramid. One of the two, either Mysteries or Secrets. But in T. Peter Tompkins' book, I think it's called Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramid. He talks about how in South America, Central America, or even in Mexico, that they got a, an indigenous people, people either the Incas, the Aztecs, the Mayas, we know that it comes from the origin of the, 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 the Omec, that do, would do this ritual once a year to unleash the Earth's